did ask real quickly before I introduce the next speaker. Uh, after we're done here, we have it set up to uh, go down to the boathouse for anyone who would like to go down. We'll do a little bit of rigging there. I can, I can help anybody with uh, rigging. I hope it's going to go down there and uh, just show you around. We'll have the hurry if anybody wants, wants to try or look at any of the uh, We have coffee, set out coffee, and donuts. Uh, how many of you just Speaker's Pat Brown. Pat was uh, rode at uh, Fairfield University, Ooh. came down here, coached for a couple years, went on, he was at Oklahoma, in uh, all, all over the place. <laughs> and now he's up at Wisconsin too. And I asked, I thought Pat would be a big person to come down and talk about what he's seen and to share a few of his, his ideas with you. So, Pat Brown. Okay, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks in the back. <laughs> All right, so uh, I am from Concept2, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Blade Path, and this is more just information for you to have, uh, and it really does apply to um, our ores and how we developed our ores, but it's information that you can use to select any ore. This isn't a sales pitch from Concept2. It's really an opportunity for you to understand why we designed the blade that we have and why we think it's, uh, it's an efficient blade for, for competitive racing. Okay. Uh, and, and also, real quick, this is... 30 years of research that I'm trying to put down in 18 minutes, and the first time I went through it, it took me about 45 minutes. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll go through some of these pretty quick. Um, all right, so the first thing, and I think uh, Mike talks a lot about this as well, is it's really important to recognize that most of your energy losses and gains are going to be with your athlete. Our research has shown that uh, about 5.9% of it's going to be how the blade interacts with that athlete in the water and then the boat that you choose to use. So the argument can be made that 5.9% is a significant amount, and it's not something that you want to take lightly if you're trying to give yourself the competitive edge. Uh, but first, you've got to decide what is your objective. Uh, do you want to create consistency of equipment in your boathouse? If you want one type of oar that can be used with any boat, with any athlete at any level, uh, you're going to be shopping around for one thing, uh, or do you want to seek a level playing field, or more importantly, do you want to find a competitive edge? So it's really important that you uh, sort of assess your situation and your program to figure out what's going to be the best fit for you. And I think it's really important to note that it is okay to stick with what you have. Not everyone should buy the latest and greatest thing just because it's the latest and greatest uh, innovation. All right, so what you need to know for this talk, what makes one blade more efficient than the other? What style of technique do you, you coach? And then how does that blade assist your athlete? And for each person in here, it may, uh, how the blade is designed may interact with the style of coaching that, that you teach uh, and how your athlete rows. All right, so this is how we started to develop uh, the efficiency of our blade. First, one thing we know is that the blade path of the oar through the drive does not look like this. And you often hear people say, put the blade in the water, pull it through to the finish. That's not the case. The boat doesn't stay stationary, and the oar moves through the water. Instead, this, uh, well, that was a moving, uh, a moving uh, slide, but it's not moving. But the typical movement of the oar is this motion here, this bell curve, where the blade enters the water, and you can really see it here, where boat, the boat moves from point A to point B, there is some movement in the water, making this, again, this teardrop shape, and the boat is moving past that point of rotation in the water. And so again, the boat moves past the oar. It's not the other way around where the oar moves past the boat. Okay. So now this is just looking at the blade. Uh, this one white line represents the blade, an overview of the blade as it's going through that stroke. Anything in green is the blade slipping through the water. So again, uh, as it moves through the water, there is slipping as it rotates. And when it finishes the stroke, that part in red is the blade actually leaving the water as it's moving 
towards, uh, towards the boat or towards the finish line. So our goal was to improve our blade efficiency, and the way that we went around that was just to model the ideal blade. What does the ideal blade look like, and what can we do to try and get as close to the ideal blade as possible? So that's a conception of something, and it's perfection. The ideal blade does not exist. It, it's possible to get there, but we want to get as close as we can to that model. So imagine what an ideal blade would look like. Zero slip perpendicular to the blade surface. All right, pretty straightforward. You put the blade in the water, you want to pry the boat past the blade, the blade needs to not slip in the water. Also, no resistance to movement in line with the shaft. When the blade enters the water at the catch, it's not actually immediately hitting the front of the blade, it's moving towards the finish line. So we want it to effortlessly be able to enter the water in that direction. So a model for this, so people can visualize it, is an ice skate, okay? Zero resistance perpendicular to the shaft, and very little resistance in line with the blade uh, direction of motion, okay? So if we made that model like this, it wouldn't work because the one difference between ice skating and rowing is we have a rotation. So it's much more like this, allowing for the rotation of the oar, okay? So constructing the path of the ideal blade, again, we have that, uh, the blade movement, or the boat movement is gonna influence the path. Zero slip, allowing for the rotation. And as we go through this and we place these pivot points, this is now the model that we come up with for the ideal blade. These are 12 points similar to uh, the first slide of the typical blade that are uh, separated by equal, dis uh, equal measurements of time, okay? So we'll get into this a little bit far later on, but uh, each, as the, blade, or as the handles are farther away from each other in between each, each, blade, each handle, uh, that means that there's faster motion. So you'll see here the typical, or the ideal blade is moving faster as it gets towards the finish, and early on, the lines are a little bit closer together, representing that they're moving a little bit slower. If we overlay the green being the ideal and the red being the typical, if we overlay them, you'll see that there is a bit of a difference. Most importantly, that over the same distance, the ideal blade does not finish the stroke over the same distance that, uh, of the single stroke from the typical blade. So in order to be able to match them up so the load is the same, we shorten the outboard. Okay, so already now we're learning something about the ideal blade is gonna have a shorter outboard, okay? So what did we observe in doing this? The ideal blade slips less, okay? So here's a slip pattern on the left of a typical blade versus the slip pattern on the right of an ideal blade. Again, the less the blade slips, the more it's gonna be able to uh, generate speed for your boat. The oar was made shorter to create the same load to be able to finish the stroke in the same distance. The same catch and finish angles were achieved the same amount of drive time, and the boat moved the same distance, okay? So now the boat moved the same distance, or moved the same speed because it traveled the same distance in the same amount of time, indicating the force in the blade on the water would be the same for each oar, again, with the typical oar being longer outboard than the ideal oar, all right? So the outboard level is shorter for the ideal blade, and because the outboard level is shorter for the ideal blade, the force on the handle is less. So same speed for less effort. Okay, well that's not what we're looking for. Now, if we put the same effort in there, it's the same forces applied, you're gonna get more speed for equal effort. So we've now created uh, an advantage by having something closer to the ideal blade. What about arc length? You hear, we hear a lot of coaches talk about a shorter outboard affects the arc length. Well that only works in this model, but we're rowing in this model. So arc length is actually the arc of the handle, not the blade moving through the water. Okay, again, this is a moving slide, it's beautiful. And you're not gonna get to see any of it. <laughs> uh, and so we're gonna go through this now, stroke by stroke, and you're gonna see the two blades, they start together. The green one will appear here in a second. And uh, the green one and the, is the idea, the model for the ideal, and red is the typical. Okay, so as we go through stroke by stroke, the typical blade is moving faster early on. The ideal blade is moving slower. All right, we get through perpendicular, and as we get closer to the finish, uh, now the uh, ideal blade has caught up with the typical blade, meaning the typical blade is slowing down and the ideal blade is speeding up, okay? So this is a graph through some testing. Again, just reiterating that, the rotational speed of the typical ore uh, and the ideal short ore, and just, again, reiterating that the ideal or rotate slower in the first half of the drive 
and fester in the second half of the drive. So comparing a typical blade path with an ideal blade path gives us a direction. We can start to say, what are the features on that blade that we need to try and emulate so we can get to this perfection, uh, this, this blade of perfection that we're trying to create. Less slip, like I mentioned, shorter outboard on the oar length. The hand speed goes from slow to fast, so it feels heavier early in the drive, and then it feels a little bit lighter later on after the perpendicular. So here are the features in the blade that will aid in efficiency. Surface area, curvature, tip characteristics, tip shape, reduced outboard. How am I doing? Good. Okay. Uh, so, real simple stuff, we'll go through this quick. Surface area uh, will resist slippage perpendicular to blade. Think about the ice skate. Uh, uh, curvature of the blade, the flatter blade will generate a, a heavier or slower um, feel through early on in the drive, and this is through testing that we've done on the water. And we've also added the element of the vortex edge, which I'll go into here in a second, and I'm sure you've seen these uh, on our blades. So we've added this vortex generating feature to reduce slippage perpendicular to the blade surface. Again, when the blade first enters the water, it's not loading up right away, it's moving towards the finish line, just in that first initial part of the drive. So here's two pictures showing water running down the back of the blade. On the left is a plain edge blade, on the right is a vortex edge. And so with the vortex edge, you see the water holds better to the black of the blade. And that's important because in the first part of the drive, both sides of the blade are used to help the blade hold its position in the water to create that load and it will slip less through the water. We also taper the edge, again, reducing slippage perpendicular and then allowing for a quicker rotation in the second half of the drive. Uh, so the taper edge here, again, uh, you would be amazed at how much fun it is to geek out at Concept2. We have a whole R&D lab and it's filled with diagrams like this and constant chalkboards full of equations, and it's, uh, it's really interesting. But um, again, the idea keeping water on the back side of the blade, and really that's something, a feature that, that is only being applied in the very first part of the drive, okay? So reduced outboard, a feature that increased load in the first half of the drive. Uh, however, that feature is no longer affected after the perpendicular, so it's faster in the second half, all right? So how can all this info uh, be used to help you when you're trying to decide uh, what blades you should be purchasing for your program. First, you have to know what style of rowing you coach, okay? So we have four different diagrams here. And these are simple power curves that you will see. Uh, we have it on the rowers. You can set power curve up and you can see the power curve. And some coaches really want to emphasize legs early on in the drive. Other want this slow acceleration with heavy finishes. So you have to understand how these uh, which rowing style you're coaching because it, it, it will influence how your athletes interact with the blade and the equipment that they're using, all right? It is our belief, we believe at Concept2, that it makes sense to maximize blade efficiency when the largest muscle groups are being used, which are gonna be your legs. So early on, we want it to be most efficient when you have uh, the best ability to move that efficiency. And then from the perpendicular to the finish, only the upper body and arms are engaged so the ideal model suggests that the blade speed would increase and the efficiency would be less, but it's okay because the muscle groups that you're using are less efficient at this point in the stroke. And so our blade evolution, since the big blade uh, has been the smoothie, the smoothie vortex, and now most recently the fat too, and this was a result uh, not so that we could give customers options, but rather every single one of these blades is a result of something that we discovered was gonna bring us closer to that ideal model. So again, that's what we're looking for, trying to get to that ideal model. So looking at our blades, starting from the big blade all the way up to the fat two, you're gonna have, uh, the big blade is gonna enter the water, it's gonna feel a little, it's gonna have a perceived load that's a little bit lighter because it doesn't hold the water as well at the catch, so it slips, and as a result, it moves a little bit qu uh, quicker through the water in the first half of the dive, and then in the second half of the drive, uh, it actually loads up and it slows the handle speed down. So again, if you're someone who teaches a quick catch and this gentle acceleration, but you really emphasize finish, the big blade might be a good fit for you. And there are coaches, this is one of our older blades, um, and there are coaches who still purchase this blade because it works for them and their athletes. Uh, and then as we go through the Smoothie 2 Plain Edge and the Smoothie 2 Vortex up to the Fat 2, you get a sharper grip at the water, and again, all this, the characteristics that we saw 
as we were trying to model the efficient blade. So sharper grip at the water, the first half of the drive is slower as a result of that heavier load, as a result of the blade being able to hold the water better. And as we get through the perpendicular, as we get through the perpendicular, uh, those parts and elements of the blade are lost and, and are not being used anymore, so there's that increased speed in the second half. Okay? So the last part of this, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, we did just have a new innovation, and it is the skinny shaft. All right? And what we were finding back here is that people who were using the fat too, and were, were, had been formally rowing with most, most leads, people who rode with the big blade or the smoothie two planage and made the jump to the fat too, found the blade to be a little bit uncomfortable, maybe is the wrong word, but a little bit too heavy for their athletes at the catch. It held the water too well. And so what we wanted to do was say, we wanted to create a shaft that would give it a feel of a smoothie two plain edge or a big blade, give you the efficiency of the fat two. And so again, you get it to use a more efficient blade because it's the blade and how the blade interacts with the water that's going to be able to generate boat speed. But it gives the athletes something uh, that they're familiar and comfortable with. So uh, if you want more info on the skinny, we have some on display out here. And uh, it's a little bit hard to tell. You can really notice it up by the handle. But it is, uh, if we had an ultralight here, I think you would really be able to see the difference. But again, the bending characteristics of the skinny shaft, again, give it a similar feel to uh, our, le le our least efficient blades, but it gives it the efficiency of our most recent blade. Thanks. All right, two minutes left. Uh, I can take any questions, and I finished on time. Anyone is welcome to email me, call me if they have any questions, if you want to talk about blades, if you want to go more into depth about any of the information. Yeah. Sure, low eye blade, uh, the low eye blade is a, a lighter overall weight, and it's a blade where the weight in the hands uh, is less. So some people really prefer to have that feeling when they place the blade in the water, they really feel the weight of the blade pulling the blade down into the water. And the low eye is much more of a neutral weight. We bring the balancing point towards the pin. It's really so that someone who likes to row stro high stroke ratings can get to through the turnarounds quicker and not feel that, that weight in the hands. Yep. Yeah. If you were coaching, say, novice girls, yes. uh, and, and you really don't want to put a, a heavy load on them, mm -hmm. It, the, the blade efficiency is a, is a perceived load based on how, so how you rig it. And Mike might be able to speak a little bit more about that. But the load, the overall load is going to be a result of how you rig it. So yeah. And I don't know if that is exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. I always think of it as riding a 10 bike and shifting through the gears. So just use that as a point of reference for that Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, we initially started in our testing, we were saying five to six centimeters shorter than the smoothie two plain edge. Uh, and we have found that some coaches have been um, going even shorter than that. And they really feel like the fat two is, is, is really fish and blade and they've even shortened it up more. So. It does take a little bit of trial and error with your team and doing some testing, but the benchmark is, is about five to seven centimeters. Uh, it, again, that we, we try and advise people to do their own experimentation rather than recommend numbers. And I know, I think Mike, you do this a little bit too. It really comes down to the individual. And we get that people constantly call in and want, want a number. But who am I to say what rigging numbers you should have with your athletes? So, yep. Anyone else? Yeah. And that's what we that's what we say, yeah. And I say call Mike Davenport, so <laughs> yeah, Casey. What's the shortest? Uh, well, we, I've seen it down at, uh, most recently, it was uh, 358 for a fat two for a men's team. And that was someone who really wanted to experiment, and it was a, a university here in the States. So, yeah. 
And then we just had American Samoa call and some awards for sweet boards that were like 2D9. And we're scratching our heads trying to make those for them, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you.